Hi, I'm Jim McCann, founder of 1-800-Flowers. We created this podcast to share the wonderful people we get to interact with, we get to meet, we get to know, and most importantly, get to learn from. So I invite you to join us on this journey here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. We're privileged this morning to be speaking with a team that's, that is Musicians on Call. We have Pete Griffin, who's the CEO. We have Alisa, Alyssa Pollock, who's the chair, also with iHeartMedia. And the uh, famous Gavin DeGraw, who uh, we just heard a wonderful story about how you made someone's uh, special moment a little bit more special. Pete, quick, tell that story if you would. Yeah, so uh, Monday night uh, in New York City, we had a, a big event celebrating caregivers. So we threw, the, threw a party just really to thank caregivers for all that they do for us. And we had a lot of great artists come out from, you know, Goo Goo Dolls and Train and OAR. Um, and as part of the event, we had one of our, our caregivers come up on stage and uh, I was just chatting with her about music, musicians on call and what's her experience with the healing power of music. But one of the questions I asked her uh, was what was one of your favorite uh, moments with musicians on call? Because she's actually been a uh, caregiver that we've worked with for over 20 years now. And uh, she said it was when that when Gavin DeGraw visited her hospital and um, how much joy that brought her and her staff and they couldn't believe that it was here. And I think she shared that one of the patients uh, after seeing Gavin perform for them in the room said, gosh, that guy sounds just like this guy on the radio, Gavin DeGraw that I've listened to. <laughs> and uh, she was like, no, that's actually him. Um, so it was just funny because then, um, you know, Gavin's got this, this great residency in New York going on this week. and. Literally, as I got off stage, uh, Gavin texted me and said, you know, hey, is that event still going on? Can I stop by? And um, he came to the event and we were able to surprise that caregiver with him being there, which was another pretty magical moment. So that was pretty cool. Gavin, how good uh, does it make you feel that you you really did make someone's uh, night and she'll tell that story forever? Amazing. I mean, uh, it's uh, pretty special. I don't feel like I did anything. Uh, you know, and uh, I think that, that's why it's it's always a surprise uh, if somebody reacts like that. You know, um, when you're a songwriter and you're a musician, uh, you you know you make these records in in these sort of these vacuum environments. It's, it's an amazing feeling when you meet somebody who the music has affected in that way and it's stayed with them in that in that way. And when they come up and 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 tell you what it means to them. It reminds you as the artist or the songwriter that, wow, uh, it brings you back to that feeling you had when you were writing the song, just getting the reaction from somebody of how it affected them, you know? And how different it might be from your uh, impression of the song and what it meant to you when you wrote it. So, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. But you lose ownership of that. Now other people have their memories connected to it. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, I, I remember there was a tune years ago I wrote named uh, Waterfall and I had my own interpretation of the song. It was about this girl and she this and she that. And there was some heartbreak involved, huh? Yeah, 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 it was. And and it was uh but but it was I had it was this really pretty sentiment about someone. And uh and about 10 years into playing the song, uh, a woman came up to me and she said, I love this song, Waterfall, and I love how it's about your relationship with God. And I said, wow, that's not why I wrote it. But now forever, I'm my perspective on the song and my angle of how I view the song had changed simply by what someone else said to me, how it, it how they interpreted the song. So it, it's pretty interesting uh, how it can, uh, it, it can morph in, in that way and, and how, how music can mean so much to people and, and, and become such a personal uh, part of their own lives. Even even sometimes their ownership that they take of the song um, can be deeper than my initial ownership of the song. It's, it's really magical. It really is magic. And, and the magic of what you guys do at Musicians on Call is center stage. But uh, as a musician, you're on tour now. Tell us a little bit about that, Kevin. Yeah, uh, well, right now I'm... Uh, I had put out a Christmas album. It's a classic Christmas album, which is why I named it a classic Christmas. <laughs> it's a really old school, uh, traditional Christmas record, you know, because um, one of my favorite records of all time is the Bing Crosby White Christmas record. You know, no disrespect to the pop Christmas records that come out, but I I, I gravitate toward really traditional Christmas 
music during Christmas time. It's a, you know, Christmas is a tradition. I like traditional music for Christmas, right? That's just me. So, uh, so I made a record like that. Um, and we, we partnered uh, with, with, uh, Cafe Carlisle, the Carlisle hotel to do a residency here as, as part of the, you know, the fun element and the local element of putting the album out and celebrating Christmas time. And, you know, Christmas in New York is an awesome thing to do. It's, it's been what, very- and what a nice setting, what an intimate setting is it? It's so different from where you usually perform. Uh, are, you, are you enjoying it? I love it. I love it, man. We're, uh, we're a few days into it now. Um, tonight will be night three. First night was, I, I thought it was really cool. And then last night was just, uh, I, I think we hit another level last night and you know how it is, uh, the more, the more time you spend somewhere, the more comfortable you get. And maybe yes. I'm getting, getting too comfortable, you know, I'm going to bring my own chair pretty soon. And... <laughs> <laughs> what was show one and show two different in your mind? Definitely. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, show one, of course, is the initial, the, the jitters of, of, of the, uh, every first show is just a different thing and um i got together with the musicians uh, only the day before show um just because schedule but i knew i knew a few of the guys because i know them from from years ago 20 boy 20 three years ago 24 years ago uh, the guitar player and the bass player and i used to play together in in local bars here in new york city Oh, and no I called, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So, it's, uh, so a guy named Osnoy. You were allowed to play in bars at five years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the bar backing, right? So, <laughs> so Osnoy, who is a, a amazing guitar player, and Conrad Korsh, this amazing uh, bass player, guys who I knew back then. Um, I called Oz and I said, I want to do this residency. What do you think? Can we put this thing together? He goes, oh, yeah, I got just the guys. Let me call some guys. And uh, it just came together almost a snap of a finger. Um, and they're all such great musicians that were, you know, we decided even last night, we we called audibles, you know, songs that, that none of us had ever played together. In fact, songs that none of us had ever played at all. <laughs> but, Is that right? I swear to God. No, that's great. So, yeah. so you are comfortable. <laughs> yeah, so... You know, but that's also the fun of it. That's the fun of doing a residency. That's the fun of doing a residency in an environment like this at the Carlisle in New York City. It's an artistic town. It's a creative town. And audiences who come to places like this, they want to see people experiment and have fun and, you know, loosen their tie and, um, you know, try try things out in, in front of them. That's the, you know, that's the beauty of a cabaret now, style. Now, Alyssa, can you imagine Gavin a tie? <laughs> no, I can't. But I'm excited to go tonight to the show. So I'll yes. be fine. I'm very excited. Yes. So, uh, Gavin, uh, Alyssa's going to be there tonight. We'll try and convince her to behave. But how much does <laughs> the composition, the interaction with the audience, how much does it change how, how you guys feel performing? How much does it influence what songs you choose to play? What's going on in the news? Does any of that uh, impact you? Uh, everything's a factor, right? Uh, a lot of the times it's, uh, the context of the night, right? So just the context of the night and the context of the time of year, you know, of course we're selecting these types of songs because this is, this is the time of year to celebrate and yep. think of family and remember. And friends. That's exactly right. Think of your family and your friends and remember the people you love and celebrate them. Um, you know, drink eggnog so you get a stomach ache, and you know, <laughs> maybe, you know maybe hit it it's with a Don nutmeg. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, I I think that it's a uh, everything's a factor and everything's a variable, and but this is the time of year to you know to focus on, on the good things. Do you feel the ghost of Bobby Short in that room? <laughs> You know, someone else was talking about Bobby Short last night. And no, I, I don't I don't I don't know. I'm not familiar with Bobby Short. So they're like, his picture's right up there. He's right over there. <laughs> right over there, you know. So, People know that room because Bobby Short performed there for so many years and he oh, had really? that warm, comfortable, intimate style, uh, like uh, like you're uh, capturing uh these nights in your residency at the Carlisle Hotel. Wow. I'm going to now see now I have to look something up and see if there, there's some are there videos online of him performances? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really? Oh, yep. wow. 
Wow. So just just curiosity, do you know any particular songs that he was well known for covering or performing? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, but he had a real cabaret style. And oh. that was he was the resident guy there for years and years and years uh, at uh, he, he just had one of those throwback kind of styles. I love that. I love that. Because, you know, years ago, I used to go to this uh, this place uh, in, in Hell's Kitchen when I moved to Hell's Kitchen. I moved there in uh, March 4th of 1998. And I was, you know, right, working on these songs, writing songs. And I would walk to this piano bar in the neighborhood called Don't Tell Mamas. And I'd go in there with my notebook. And I got to know the staff a little bit. And, and I knew it was a, a real tourist joint, you know, because it was in the theater district. And I yep. go and say, hey, would you mind? And maybe I could... I wrote a new song today. Can I, can I, would you mind if I sat at the piano and played for these tourists? I want to see if they like it. And I would go in there with new songs. Uh, all that stuff. Yeah. And I would play for just strangers because I wanted to see what songs people would react to. You know, they didn't know me. I didn't know them. I was, you know, I didn't have a career happening yet. And I, that's how I was filtering through songs I was writing, seeing how strangers would react to, uh, to material. So doing this gig here is really reminiscent of the, all those cabaret acts that were coming in playing Don't Tell Mamas because they had all these little, they had a couple of cabaret rooms in the back and yep, yep. So they had uh, uh, all the bartending staff and the cocktail waitresses. They all performed. They were all Broadway stars. And when they were off, you know, when they were not in, uh, cast in something, they'd work at the bar and they would do their, do their songs and do their shtick. And it was uh, it was a ball. I had an absolute ball. I wonder how many waiters and waitresses could belt out a song because they're moonlighting uh, waiting tables in between uh, gigs. I think it's probably a pretty good percentage. Countless, countless. Well, Bobby Short, is, I think it, one of the songs he's most famous for playing there in the cabaret was I'm in Love Again. And he did okay. a great rendition of a song called Manhattan. And then the, the other called one. Called Manhattan? Just called Manhattan. And yeah. uh, he had one that he finished up with, which is, uh, I happen to be, I happen to like New York. It's called, I happen to like New York. Yep. <laughs> and he's quintessentially Mr. New York. Do you remember his music, uh, Alyssa? I don't actually, but I, I have a feeling. I can't, I'm I can't be York. hanging around with all you young <laughs> punks. <laughs> but Jim, thanks to you. I feel like I might be getting some later. So that's great. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I could learn one of these for a show, it would be really cool. It really would, because uh, you're in his room. Yeah, I mean that would be a great way to pay homage. Yep. Now, by the way, to be to be fair, I don't know that the folks that don't tell Mama were really going out on a limb with Gavin because I started listening to Gavin in bars in probably around 2000, and every song that he had written, you know, just at that point was a monster hit. Um, you know, and it was like I used to, I used to go there to friends at the uh, the Red Lion. I think like every Tuesday night or something. And it was like every single song he played, you were just, I remember the first time I saw him, I was like, I was like, I, I must have heard these songs before because every single one of them, I feel like I knew already. And he was like, no, these are all his original songs. This is, I was like, holy crap, this guy is unreal. And we used to go back week after week. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was just uh, monster hits. I imagine if, if he strolled into Don't Tell Mama and played some of these songs, I'm sure they were like, yeah, why don't you keep coming back and trying out this new music? <laughs> Maybe we'll throw you a bucket too. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's no coincidence that Gavin is here because Pete and I are probably his two biggest fans on the planet outside of the work <laughs> we do together at Musicians on Call. From a music perspective, I think, you know, I'm also one of the biggest fans Gavin oh. has. And, you know, very appropriate yeah. to the real conversation we're having about the healing power of music. I didn't think I would tell this story, but... I lost my mom this last weekend and you oh, know man. I was supposed to go to the show and I was a little torn obviously at the beginning and I, I talked to Gavin yesterday and I said you know when I really thought about this I was like I don't think there's any medicine that's going to be better for me than hearing your voice you know tonight so honestly just in terms of the healing power of music and how it affects you I know that that the joy I'm going to get tonight from hearing Gavin sing and hearing those songs I've loved for so long are absolutely going to be exactly the uplifting thing that I need right now. Sounds like the perfect medicine. Sorry to hear about your loss oh, there, Alyssa. Yeah. But boy, that is testimony to how music tells us how to feel, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think it's one of the biggest 
emotional, you know, inspirations that any of us have, right? From like the breakup songs to the makeup songs to the party songs to whatever. I mean, I think there's no greater force for me than music and how it influences how I feel and how my mood is and what I'm doing. And Gavin specifically, one of the biggest influences of joy in my life as it relates to his music. So. Well, Gavin, it's pretty good to have a a, a number one fan uh, in Alyssa Pollock because she has this is a awesome. say in what uh, in what people listen to. Tell us a little bit about your career, Alyssa. It's nothing short of amazing. Uh, you know, I've been at iHeart coming up on thirty years. I also started at five years old. <laughs> um, so I was, in, yeah, I was an intern at Z100 in New York, and I never left. So I've been with the company, you know, for again, for almost 30 years. And it's been an incredible experience because again, I went into that internship because I loved music. And I thought to myself, what an amazing thing to just be part of anything that includes music. I never realized I, I would be there my whole career, but uh, you know, it's been a blessing because you know it's allowed me to continue to be involved in something I'm so passionate about personally, but mm -hmm. also to be able to affect the dreams and the careers and be a part of the magic of so many artists that I, I get to meet on a daily basis, including Gavin, you know, and because I've been there so long, today's, some of today's biggest artists are people I've met before anyone even knew who they were, you know, including yeah. Taylor Swift in a conference room with seven people and, you know, all these. Taylor who? Yeah, that girl. <laughs> Excuse me, the, the person of the year. <laughs> Time, Time Magazine person of the year. But again, you know, you watch these artists come in, you know, with a dream and a song, and then you see them selling out stadiums or doing these giant tours or, you know, the success that they have and the impact that their music has. And it never gets old for me. Never. You know, but look in, in your brief career there at iHeart, who is the morning crew, by the way, when you started uh, on, on Z100? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it, I, I don't think it was Elvis Duran yet, actually. Um, I want to say it was Elliot. Um, uh -huh. But then soon after was Elvis. But look at how you the music business you're in the in the broadcast and 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 streaming and concert producing side of the world. But look how much it's changed during your career, Pete's career, and Gavin's career. It's just changed so dramatically. And you mentioned Taylor Swift; she's changing the world once again. I mean, financial success, her ability to sell out a stadium in almost every part of the world. She's a unique example, obviously, but I, I think there's so many different artists in different genres that affect people in a big way. I mean, recently, like I've been working with the band Shinedown, right? And, you know, and they're more of a, a rock pop kind of band. They're, they're kind of multi-genre. But what impressed me was the amount of work that they're doing around you know, mental health and, and suicide awareness and things like that. And what I love is, and that's part of what has been so impactful for me working at iHeart, but also being able to work with an organization like this is I love to see the impact music has, but I also love when you see the artists and the bands like Gavin, you know, Rachel Platt and, you know, Shine Down, you know, uh, Papa Roach. And there's so many different variations of it. Elton John, like when people are so passionate about causes and they're able to use that platform to give back in such a big way and to be able to deliver such a big impact. It, I, I love watching that. And I think it's so amazing. Pete, you get to work with people like Gavin, as uh, uh, Alyssa just mentioned, who are so they've reached a great fame and, and fortune and uh, a great point in their careers. Yet they're still willing to give their time and make a difference in other people's lives. It must give you energy in the in the 10 years that you've been at Musicians on Call. Uh, what uh, what gets you excited, uh, especially as you come up to a time of the year like like we are now, the holiday time? Yeah, well, it's interesting, you know, I think that, you know, when Musicians on Call began, I think it was really under the premise of how can we just bring some music and some fun to hospitals, which can be, you know, tough places to spend some time at, you know, it's there's, there's different sounds and beeps and moans, and there's not a lot of, you know, not a lot of beauty to look at, everyone's going through a really tough time. And so I think the idea was to bring just some some entertainment and some fun. But what's changed over the past 25 years that, since we've started is that music has actually been shown to heal people. It's I mean, study after study comes out year after year about what you know music has done with cancer patients to help with pain management, what it's done to help lower blood pressure and stress levels and 
uh, improve mental health and mental outlook. Um, there was even a study that during the pandemic from the University of London that said people that listen to 30 minutes of music a day during the pandemic have lower levels of anxiety and depression. And so there's all these things that happen. And so when you when you ask about motivation, you know, for for me and for all of us that that do this and bringing music to to healthcare facilities, we know that we can help people. And it's while it is fun and entertaining, it's actually helping people heal and helping people get through a really difficult time. Whether it's what you know Alyssa mentioned with want, wanting to really need like a, a mental boost and um, just a mood boost um, from going through a difficult time. Um, to even what Gavin mentioned earlier, which is, you know, as an artist, you know, getting back to, you know, the root of why you started in music and, and the impact that music can can have on you. Um, that's our motivation is like we just know that there's so much more we can do. And so when we work with partners, when we work with artists, um, when we're developing new technology, we're doing it all under the premise that we know there's people that need help today. And we want to try to help as many people as possible. And that's really, I think, what motivates us is being able to see the impact of it and knowing that there's a lot more that we can do. And, you know, just to add to that, Pete, I mean, what I love about Musicians on Call is that music is the universal connector. So, you know, charity is very personal to people, it, you know, and it, it usually is based on the experiences you've had and whether that's cancer or diabetes or veterans or whatever it is that, that somebody's particularly passionate about. Musicians on call and music, it heals everybody and it affects everybody. So we always have the ability to partner even more specifically with different people that are that are dealing with different things. But at the end of the day, everybody benefits from it versus, you know, a, a select or specific group of people. Well, that goes to the story that Pete told before about what happened on stage uh, with the caregiver you recognize, because it's not, as you say, Alyssa, just the patients it's the doctors it's the nurses it's the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the professional staff in the hospitals it's the families of the patients who have a, a moment of joy when they see someone who they care so much about have a smile on their face when they hadn't been one there for a while it, it does as you say Alyssa, impact everybody around you I'll, I'll tell you what i uh years ago my my mother uh when she was going through uh, uh cancer treatment we were at the uh, at, at the hospital, and she's she was laid up there, and um, there was a little room off to the side that had a piano in it. And uh, this old fella came in, and uh, I was just sitting in the room, and uh, this old fella came in, and he was a patient, and he sat down at the piano, and he was fantastic piano player fantastic and he started playing these these great old standards uh the whole sinatra catalog it was just one great song after the next and he was in there playing as a patient i was in there visiting patient but uh it was so uplifting for me to listen to this guy play music uh, in that environment, I thought, wow, this, I needed this right now. And he was in there, you know, hooked up to uh, an IV drip. Was he really? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, even, even as a recipient of someone else's uh, uh, skills and talents, uh, you, you feel it as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, years ago, I was, uh, say I was 15 years old and the family's Christmas present was uh, to go to a concert, right? So we all got uh, uh, concert tickets to see Billy Joel. At that time in my life, I really wanted to go to medical school. And uh, yeah, not that I had the grades, but I wanted to go to medical school. So anyway, uh, we go to this concert. We've got nosebleeds, you know. Where is it? It was at the Knickerbocker Arena in Albany, New York, which I'm sure uh -huh. has been named, renamed by now. I can't remember the name of it now because I remember I was telling this story on, on stage when because I, I was lucky enough that Billy Joel had actually invited me to open up for him a bunch of shows and he was listening to me telling this exact story on stage and he goes, <laughs> got on stage and he got on stage next. He goes, actually, you know, I remember the Knickerbocker and it's been renamed. Now it's called the, I think it's like the Bank of America Arena. Or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I was like, wow, he actually watched my show. Um, which is awesome. But I'm 15 years old. I'm there with my family. 
And um, of course, we're all mesmerized because it's Billy Joel, you know, and he's a, 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 a world class talent. And he puts on this amazing show and he's so relatable from the stage. He's 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 behind the piano, but the way he talks from behind the piano, you feel like you're sitting across the kitchen table from him. It's so yeah, it's so sure. Personal, right. And he's doing these songs. He's playing these great songs and everybody's singing along. Strangers around me are singing along. And, and I just watch people I don't know, just the countless people around me, the joy that came, uh, the joy that overcame them. Um, and it was the first time in my life that I, I, I remember very vividly saying to myself, wow, music is medicine. I, I've never thought about it like that before. I thought it was just this personal thing, but I, I'm seeing how it's affecting these people around me. Maybe it's not going to cure a disease, but it is medicinal. And uh, it's really helping these people the way it was helping me. It was helping me it, uh, when I was playing music, but it was helping me seeing it. But I didn't know everybody felt it like that. Yeah. I thought it was such a personal thing. But I could see that it's a personal thing for everybody. It's really universal. Um, and it was it was actually that show that I got in the car with my family afterward. And I said, I know what I want to do for a living now. Isn't that amazing? Literally in the car, I said it out loud. And they said, what do you want to do? I said, I'm going to do that. We put our heart into everything we do. We are farmers bakers, florists, and makers who grow and create with a passion. Made with love at every step of the way. Because at the end of the day, we know you're sending more than a gift. 1-800-Flowers, share with love. Alyssa, how many people do you know have been to a dozen or more Billy Joel shows at the Garden? I know a lot of them, <laughs> but I, I would go all the time when Gavin opened because obviously he's he's my Billy Joel. But um, <laughs> I love both of them. But Gavin opening up was one of the greatest joys of I mean, to watch it, because I do think, Gavin, I think you are the modern day Billy Joel. You are the new piano man. And if there's that's anyone yeah. that could carry on that legacy in my mind, that's 100 percent you. Well, that's the biggest compliment I'll ever get in my life. You wear it well. <laughs> I'm such a fan. Thank you. Pete, give us a give us a little information on on musicians on call today. Uh, you gave us a little sense of its roots, uh, twenty almost twenty five years after its creation. How did it start, and and get, give us a sense of the scale of it today? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we you know the original vision was really to just have regular programs up at uh, Sloan Kettering in New York, where the, where the organization and program started. But now we're at a place where we've got programs in all 50 states. Um, we're starting to have conversations about expanding internationally. Um, so the organization has grown from, you know, a local hospital program to one which we're the largest provider of, uh, of music and healthcare facilities in the U.S. And, and most likely the world. Sit back a little as you talk so we can see that sweater, uh, that shirt you're wearing. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've got my musicians on call uh, Christmas, uh, Christmas uh, shirt that's really, on today. That's really nice. I want one. <laughs> I'll send you one, Gavin. Give me a lord. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, you know, during the pandemic, we we really started to invest more and more into technology because I think one of the things that we saw is that the demand for what we do is so high. Um, hospitals all around the country, all, all around the world now see and understand uh, the benefits of the healing power of music and they want it. And we knew that if we were to operate the same way we had been for the past number of years, we just we would have had to have blown up our budget in order to really scale to the level we wanted to. And so... We've been building out this technology that in many ways is essentially creating Uber for hospitals to get connected to trained volunteers and musicians in their area. So it's allowing both volunteers, musicians, and hospitals to go to our, our website, to go through training and onboarding to become a part of Musicians on Call. And then once they're there, they can start to connect directly so they can schedule uh, music at their facilities and, and volunteers and musicians can schedule time to volunteer at their local facilities. And so uh, it's really going to be a transformative um, change for us because it's going to allow us to scale. It's going to give our musicians more opportunities. 
And I think the thing that's really exciting for us is that, you know, traditionally we go to big hospitals in big cities because, you know, a volunteer can go and see, you know, 30, 40 patients in a visit. Um, whereas if you're in a rural community or in a small facility, you know, that would be, you wouldn't be able to have as much, uh, see as many people really. Um, but we also know those are maybe the places that need our program the most. They may not have the resources. They may not have access to a lot of the bells and whistles of a big hospital. And so this technology is going to allow us to level the playing field and bring music to, to people no matter where they're at. Um, so that whether you're at Sloan Kettering in New York or you're at a, a rural community health center, you'd still have the same access to, to music either live or virtually. And so, um, you know, that's the direction we're going. I think it's, it's pretty exciting because it's, it's going to really change how music is used in the healing process. And um, it, it allows us to build on that foundation we've, we've built over the last you know, 24 years. If people wanted to help musicians on call, what what could you use? Maybe some uh, money, uh, volunteers, uh, volunteers who are musicians, volunteers who are just facilitators. What is it you, you people could do to to help you? Sure. Well, you know, we really do need volunteers as we start to scale. And I think the real the fun of musicians on call is that you know you don't have to be a Gavin DeGraw in order to volunteer with us. Um, we have local. But that's how you. That's how you can become a Gavin DeCar. Exactly. And by the way, there's a lot of people that have come up through our program as volunteers that are now, you know, folks that Alyssa plays on the on on her radio stations. But, um, you know, the interesting thing is we have musicians that volunteer with us, but we also have opportunities for non musicians, which is very unique. And what can those non musicians do? Yeah. So we have what we call volunteer guides, and those are folks that are trained at a specific healthcare facility, so that when a musician comes, they guide and take that musician around room to room. So they know how to navigate the hospital hallways. They know if it says, you know, a certain thing on the door, that means you can't go in that room. And so they basically facilitate the visit for us. So if you're a music lover um, and you want to do something to get involved in the community, but you're not a musician, uh, it's an amazing way to volunteer and give back in a really meaningful way. And um, I think that's These are people like Alyssa Early in her career who just know how to get things done. Yeah, well, Alyssa is a, a unicorn because there's nothing, there's, there's no way anyone could possibly help an organization more from, from finding volunteers to raising money to connecting us to partners to uh, building our brand. Uh, Alyssa's done it all. So we're, uh, we're, I think, I mean, we're forever indebted to her because of all she's done to transform our organization. So could people yeah. go to the Musicians on Call website uh, and don't make a donation, especially at the holiday season? Yeah, they can. If you go to musiciansoncall.org, you can you can go there to both donate to us, and then you could also volunteer, sign up to volunteer with us. Um, but all that, I think, as you you just mentioned, is so important this time of year. The last place anyone wants to be during the holidays is in a hospital, um, separated from your loved ones, um, you know, by yourself many times. And it's funny because while the music we bring is fantastic, one of the biggest pieces of feedback we get is when patients or their families say, you know what? It just meant so much to us that a stranger decided to come and spend time with us, you know, during the holidays. Um, and so there's just that human to human connection that our program also brings that means so much to people. It's just the humanity of being there for your neighbor. Um, and uh, the music is is the bonus, but just the, the community and the bond that it builds it makes a big difference in itself. And I'd love to give kudos to Pete because during the pandemic and what probably should have been the hardest time for an organization that is for sure going into going into hospital rooms, the, the organization was really able to transform and create programs and figure out ways to actually touch more people than we even had with the live programs, you know, putting together programs for during the holidays, for Veterans Day, you know, for prom, you know, bringing prom to teens that weren't able to attend. And we even were able to have the one millionth patient um, receive a song from Garth Brooks in, in a hospital in Staten Island. I mean, so it, it's incredible how I think we're the only organization that actually has the infrastructure to be able to beam content into 5,000 hospitals around the country. So when people are supporting musicians on call, aside from obviously the programs of people going into the room, the impact that they're able to bring and the amount of people they're able to touch with the music to, to Pete's credit and the team's credit is actually amazing. And, you know, so there are a lot of people being touched by this music one way or another. 
All right, Gavin, we're going to test uh, uh, Pete now. Pete, someone goes to the website, musiciansoncall.org, and says, I got a million dollars that I want to give away, and I'm going to give it to Musicians on Call. What would you do with the money? Well, believe it or not, Jim, it's an easy question to answer, which is um, this technology that I spoke about, we want to finish building it. Um, so that money would go to helping to finish build our technology out. Um, which is going to allow us to, again, schedule visits both in person and virtually uh, anywhere that people are. Um, so that's what we're focused on right now, raising money to finish this technology. And then in turn, you know, we would, you know, use some of those funds to help, you know, bring on some more staff so that we can manage more programs. But at the end of the day, we're building the, the foundation, the infrastructure that's going to allow us to scale and really transform the healthcare industry. Um, so that's where the million bucks would go. And the, the thing, too, is that we've already I can tell you that we've already got, you know, a, a, a version of this platform up and running. Um, it's not even fully complete. And we've already played for over 250,000 people using the platform in its unfinished state right now. So to think about where we can go once it's finished, um, the scale, I mean, you're going to it's almost like for a million dollars the impact it's going to have. I, I don't know that there's any organizations that could do as much with that million dollars because of the scale we'll be able to reach with that type of investment. And what so, you've already put in place, yeah. Gavin DeGro, what would you say to a, a young musician or a young volunteer who doesn't have the uh, musician skills but likes music, likes making a difference in people's lives? Tell us about how you got involved with Musicians on Call and what it meant to you. What might it mean to them? Well, as a musician, I think uh, in, in general, uh, it, it's great to play for people who appreciate what you're doing, first of all. So as a musician, yep. as a musician, even if you were winning selfishly for the enjoyment of performing for people who want to give you the benefit of the doubt when they're listening to you, um, I, I think it's a, a, a very healthy thing to do as a musician because you're you're in an environment where people are going to appreciate the fact that you showed up at all to to perform for them, to entertain them, to spend time with them, and and to to humanize them in an environment where they're they are getting care. But you know, it's that's one of the one of the things of, of about being in a hospital, as we all we all know, when you spend enough time in a hospital and you're seeing someone who's spending a legitimate amount of time in a hospital when you're kind of stuck there you start feeling like you're part of the apparatus of the hospital and by bringing music into the environment you help humanize the people there again and and because they can express their other tastes that go beyond you know the food isn't good or you know, I need to go to the bathroom. Like, you know, it's, mm -hmm. oh, wow, this person has has other life interests. And, and and it really helps, I think, build that community within the hospital. Also seeing caregivers, seeing patients have these other tastes in real life that are they're expressing within the hospital that have nothing to do with the apparatus of the hospital. And I think there's a, an important piece of that. Uh, that the music sheds sheds light on and sharing music together sheds light on um and just interacting with someone who is not part of the system of the hospital just helps bring in another personality type you know some other just some other interest some other character right um yep. and i think that's very healthy i think it's healthy for the for the musicians um as well i think it's healthy for people who are not musicians and i think it i think that as a just on a cultural level it's important that people remember that um if you're lucky you get the chance to go to the hospital to get care at some point in your life um good point so chances are a lot of us are going to end up in that, a similar environment needing some care um, and wouldn't it be nice to have someone else come in who just want to say, hey, what's up, man? You got a you got a favorite song or something or, you know, you want to bullshit with me for a little while and like talk about something else that, you know, you may have some other interest in and 
hang out with somebody who's not wearing a gown, you know, and, and let's give them a little bit, just something else, some other thing, you know, to remind them that, um, that they're, they're just like you. They're just, they're just in there right now. That's all. You how know? often, how often do you find that the people you're performing for want to sing along? They just, they just can't help it. It bubbles out. Happens all the time, you know, and you'll you'll meet you'll meet people who uh, who decided that when, because of programs like Musicians on Call, they may have not have ever played an instrument before, but uh -huh. through in an environment where, where now they have time, they have time, they're they're bored, they're there, they're, they're bored, yes. and they go, you know, I want to learn something like my want to learn the guitar, maybe I want to learn a keyboard, you know. Yep. And the 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 culture of musicians on call is helping provide that system where people can express that level of interest and say, well, is there a keyboard around anywhere that I could go learn something? Or does anybody have any other music they want to start these conversations within the environment? And it, and, and it broadens the environment from it from it just being the apparatus of healthcare into something that's become a little more humanized for them as well. And I think it's very healthy. Who knows? Maybe we'll hear a story about a, a young person in the hospital that was treated to a performance by you, Gavin DeGraw, where they said right then when I was 15 years old and I said and knew right then in my heart that that's what I want to do. And they've gone on to do it. I hope so. I hope so. That would be amazing. I know you're breaking records at the Carlisle and, and your album, A Classic Christmas, is uh, is uh, doing great. What's what's on for the new year for you, Gavin? I have no resolutions, firstly. I'll start there. <laughs> the only person I really can't keep a promise uh, uh, with is myself. So I just stopped. Um I'm just going to, uh, you know, keep cutting records. That's, that's, that's my job. You know, my, my are, job is. Are you, are you writing now? Is that something you're doing all the time? All the time. Yeah. I, I, write, I write every day a little bit. So, yeah. um, you know, I don't, I don't obsess every day, but I write a little something every day, just to keep the, keep the juices flowing. Um, and uh, I've got a batch of material. I'm ready to, I'm ready to cut when you know when we get in the studio and, and where will you do that anywhere um the, the beauty of of recording in this era is you can do it from right here at this desk i'm sitting in now um which is which is crazy everything is as mobile as as it could possibly be pretty soon i'll be able to rent a tesla and uh and uh and cut my record while i'm sitting in traffic uh, <laughs> on autopilot <laughs> <laughs> pete what's uh what's exciting in the new year for uh musicians on call i mean for us it's you know finished building out that technology and then also really starting to expand our in-person programs you know during the pandemic obviously we couldn't get into hospitals in person and so this year we started getting back in person um i think people oftentimes forget you know we've all kind of moved on but hospitals are really this year just transitioning back to allowing volunteers and families and visitors into hospitals. And so that's really our big focus as we get into next year is recruiting more volunteers so that we can start to get our, our in-person programs, um, you know, back at the level they were before the pandemic and then, and then continuing to expand to new markets after that. So um, it's going to be an exciting year. And then, and obviously the other big news is that next year is our 25th anniversary. So um, we'll be having a big event uh, in New York, one in Nashville uh, to celebrate 25 years. Um, you better believe Gavin will be at either one or both of them. But um, as our as our like our biggest champion, the artist champion there is, and uh, with Alyssa as you our know. chairperson, um, it's gonna be it's gonna be fantastic. So Jim, expect the uh, expect the invite to the uh, to the New York event for sure. Well, I'm I'm going to be one of those people scalping tickets to get to the Carlisle in the meantime, because <laughs> that's got to be one hot ticket. And by by this evening's show, I, I have a suspicion for those people who are lucky enough to be able to get in that there'll be one Bobby Short song played after he 
uh, created that room for 50 years. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's incredible. I'm going to try to learn something. That sounds really cool to me. Alyssa, please refrain tonight from shouting out, play waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot promise anything. <laughs> when I'm at a Gavin show, I'm having a good time. So. <laughs> Well, I suspect you'll have a good time tonight. We all know that it'll be especially meaningful for you and, and for Gavin as well. You three are awfully dynamic. You're doing great work. You're musicians on call. I, I think there's such a lesson for a spirit, for enthusiasm, for giving, uh, because here at Our Little Flower Companies, we've learned that giving is a gift. And you three just uh, such living examples of people who give all the time and the gifts you get back are, are pretty plentiful. But we know that's not why you do it. No, and Jim, honestly, you, when you think about what you own and what you're involved in, what's, think of the joy, you're, you're really in line with what we're doing, because all of the things that your company sends to people, I mean, again, I, I have lots of flowers in my house right now and lots of things that have shown up. Oh, weekend. I didn't even <laughs> notice, Alyssa. <laughs> I, you know, and, and honestly, no, but, but those are the things that, that bring people joy at a time when they really need it, right? So, I'll, you know, back to you for really being the person that owns the market on delivering joy to people all the time as well. I think that's an incredible thing that, that you're doing and your company is doing. And I know you're very supportive of charity organizations as well. So just wanted to give back to you some kudos because music and but but also the things that you deliver bring joy to people as well. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, you, you guys. I got to go uh, make a donation on the site, musiciansoncall.org. I got to have my iHeart radio in the background. And if it's not playing Gavin DeCroix, I'm going to be really annoyed. I was going to say, my resolution <laughs> for 2024 is get as much Gavin DeCroix music played as possible. So. <laughs> you guys are the best. Thanks so much. Thank you. Congratulations Thank you, on all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. See you guys. It's my sister's birthday. Go to 100 flowerscom They have tons of great birthday gifts. Wow. Wow. Ooh. Happy birthday, baby. Happy birthday. Ow. Yummy. I got to contain myself. 1 800 Flowers. Celebrate the people you love. Well, I hope you enjoyed what you heard, and I know I'll be sharing it forward. I hope you get to as well. Let's keep the conversation going. Follow me along on Twitter at Jim1800 Flowers and on LinkedIn at Jim McCann. Hope to talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Celebrations Chatter. You can join our community by reaching out at chatter at celebrations.com. And while you're at it, tell us what topics you'd like us to explore here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to share it forward. <laughs>